Joanne for reaching out with the invitation to come speak and share with y'all. Yeah, it's um, it's always nice to come here. I've done it once before, and um, everyone's always so engaged um, and full of love for nature. So uh, you're my kind of folks. Mm-hmm. But uh, my name is John Christian, and I am the executive director of Larkspur Conservation. We are a 501c3 nonprofit organization, and we started in 2013. Um, I joined with Becca Stevens and Tara Armistead and a few other community organizers to create the nonprofit. And our goal was pretty simple conserve land with a revival of natural burial practices. Um, natural burial, what is that? Well, you've probably heard of green everything, green, <laughs> you know, green burial is a thing too. Natural burial has been around forever. Natural burial is simply burial of someone in the ground without chemicals, plastics, concrete, all of the things that we've kind of evolved to in as a society to help, um, to what we think help cover up and fix a situation that's very uncomfortable at the end of our lives. And we'll get more and more into detail on what that looks like and how that all works. But... um, In 2013, we started the organization. Um, I had just left um, my 15-year funeral career. Um, I'm licensed as a funeral director and embalmer, and I managed a large funeral home and cemetery in Nashville called Spring Hill on Gallatin Road at Briley Parkway. And I learned a lot from that place. It was 150 acres, and it was started in 1785. So there was a lot of history there. And I've always been a child of nature. I grew up on a farm in West Tennessee. Uh, We didn't have cable TV. We had the standard (laughs) two, four, and five, and sometimes eight out of Jackson, Tennessee. Um, So me and my brother spent all of our childhood outside. Um, And I really um, developed a love for nature at that time. My parents were really... Um, dialed into nature my whole life and I grew up on a small farm and my grandparents had a small farm too where we grew all of our own food and we had our own animals and um, it was just a wonderful way to grow up. Being in that environment I got to see death in a different way than people that live in town might. Um, When you pulled a calf on the farm uh, that didn't survive or if you were um, processing hogs or cows in the winter. I'm a vegetarian now, by the way. (laughs) But, um, you know, I I just, every little thing, I mean, from five, six years old, I remember um, getting a grasshopper out of the bucket of water at the water spigot and um, thinking, oh my gosh, look at, you know, they're normally, you know how nature is. It's always just out of grasp and just away from you. So to see something and just marvel at its existence and how awesome it is, um, I couldn't just toss it away like it was nothing and go about my business. So I would find a leaf and I would wrap it in a leaf and then I would take a fork from mom's kitchen drawer and I would bury it in a little cemetery in the woods. Um, And that kind of evolved. I had a hamster and a parakeet and occasionally the squirrel that didn't make it across the road would end up buried. But um, I told my parents in seventh grade I wanted to be a mortician, um, not really fully understanding what that was, or but I just knew that I wanted to help, and I wanted to be somebody that helped um, honor life. Um, my grandfather passed away right after I graduated from high school. And I was on a clear path to like UT Martin, West Tennessee guy, UT Martin or, you know, wherever my friends were going. And granddad died and um, I went to the funeral and it was one of the first funerals that I was able to be up, up close and personal to. I was old enough to understand what was happening and I could see my family experience the loss in a way. Um, so it really pulled my focus away from typical university Um, and typical um, college education, and I went into a liberal arts college that focused on mortuary science and funeral arts here in Nashville called John A. Gupton. And after graduating, I I worked at my local hometown funeral home and um, lived upstairs, went out in the middle of the night when someone would die, bring them back, 
do the embalming, see the family the next morning. Then we would have a ceremony in the chapel generally after a visiting hour um, or so, maybe one the night before, and we would go to the cemetery. And um, I did that for 15 years. And my career started in my small hometown, but I ended up here in Nashville. And we had some really big, we, I buried um, and took care of Earl Scruggs when he died and had big funerals at the Ryman. And I had simple, quiet funerals for babies. And I saw big and small and expensive and all of the gamut from all of the different um, traditions that we all carry with us, whether we um, believe in uh, Buddha or um, an endless universe or we're Christian or whatever. I just absorbed everything I could. And then I thought, okay, are we just going to do it this way for the rest of my life? Because that's what the owners of the company wanted. They wanted me just to stick around and do the work for them, you know? So I made a leap of faith, and three months after that, um, that departure from that uh, very serious job, I um, was contacted by Becca Stevens from Thistle Farms in St. Augustine's Chapel. And um, we began dreaming upon um, what natural burial could look like because we wanted a more mindful option for people in our area that didn't really want to spend fifteen to twenty thousand dollars on a conventional funeral with a shiny box and a concrete container and all those things and we really um, those folks that really didn't want just to have a cremation and then nothing um, so what's the middle ground there and what can we do as one last final act with our bodies that can give back to our community back to our planet um, how can we do better for everybody um, including those future generations like our grandkids that may visit that, that grave site one day when it's a really, really, really old forest. Um, so that's kind of how Larkspur came to be. In 2015, we, um, we found uh, a family who had stewarded uh, this 155-acre property uh, across from Taylor Hollow State Natural Area for many years. And their um, patriarch, Dr. Ward, had died and they were settling the estate. The last thing they wanted to do was sell the property off to someone who would timber it, turn it into a mining system or subdivide for, um, for houses on the ridge. Um, and uh, it was just, it was a nature God thing. I mean, it was like, this is the, here, you two should be together. You need to know. And that's how it all happened. It just grew and blossomed. And it's. It's been that process the whole time. Um, today, we own the 155 acres that we have placed under protection with the Nature Conservancy. And we have had 143 burials on the property. We have several hundred individuals, a couple hundred, that have pre-planned and paid ahead for themselves. Um, so that when their time comes, because we all are going to go at some point... <laughs> Um, and uh, everything will be buttoned up and in order and you'll know what to do and your children will know what to do so um, that's the whole idea and it's, it's been an honor and a privilege our first burial was in 2018 um, and then we I just had a burial uh, two days ago so it's something that more and more people are learning about uh, and more and more people are finding value in not only um, individuals like ourselves, but people in the funeral industry are becoming awakened to, oh my gosh, this is how we used to do it. And look how cool this is in the way that we're interacting with nature and bringing that therapeutic landscape close to a family who, who has experienced a loss and allowing something really beautiful to happen in a very simple way. I want to share with you some slides and we'll continue to talk. Uh, this is an aerial shot of a portion of the preserve. Uh, we're located between Bethpage and Westmoreland up in Sumner County. It's about 55 minutes from here. It's 41 miles, so with traffic and everything else that we experience in Nashville, it takes a minute to get there. But I tell everybody that comes, it's kind of like a great pilgrimage where you can just kind of let everything go on that drive. And once you get there, you can, like you do when you come to Radnor or any other park, 
um, just be in the peace and quiet, the quiet of nature. And we have it here. There, there's hardly any accessory noise or noise pollution um, at this site. So it's great for birding, which we have a ton of. And we'll share some images from the birders that have been on site. This is our uh, trailhead map. And generally when we um, gather with the family, we gather here at the trailhead. And then over here is the 172 acre state natural area, Taylor Hollow. And then we generally will make a historic or a very primitive, simple walking procession up to the gravesite, similar to what folks used to do before there was a funeral procession with cars. We walked. Um, so we walk and we make a memorial hike up into the center of the property where we've begun our burials. We have a meadow ecosystem and we have a woodland ecosystem. Jack's wife, uh, Nancy, is buried between the two, kind of in that liminal space, so that you're in the tree line, but then you have the open view of the meadow. So you get those pollinators and everything in the summer, but then you have ferns over here on the gray as well. The whole property is open for hiking, um, and there's a lot of topography change. We're at about 900 feet here. We are on the eastern highland rim, um, so we're just northeastern highland rim. Um, so there's a really great mix of biodiversity because of that topography. Um, some of our rare species are the blue-eyed Mary. Um, if you've never hiked Taylor Hollow State Natural Area, I encourage you to watch the State Natural Area's website for their spring hikes that are led by the state. They sell out every year, and um, you can sign up online, and it's just... It's probably one of the most beautiful things I've ever seen. I just cannot explain it. If, you've ever, if you have a picture of heaven in your mind, it might be that. If you're a fan of Lord of the Rings, it might be um, where uh, the elves live. It's really, really stunning. Jack, you want to speak well, to it? to mention that there are some other groups who do organize types of Taylor Hollow, the Horticultural Society. Um, Native Plant Society, yeah. Uh, it, is, it is open to the public if you go through the proper protocol, you know, arranging with the Nature Conservancy and the Department of Parks and the state. Uh, um, so I did that one time with the you know, got the permission and we limited, you know, the limited amount of people as at one time that they want to be there. So that's why it's scheduled. Generally, they'll be, they'll um, lead all the hikes and or allow someone that has been on site before to lead the hike of about 15 people so it's low impact on their trail system because the trail's this big <laughs> between a blooming endangered species. Um, and there is no proper trailhead like we have with a parking area and a, and a legend because they actively work to protect this particular property from people entering it without knowledge of how to behave. Um, that may change in the future, I'm not certain, but okay. yeah, I don't think it will. It's completely hidden, you'd never know it was there. You can see the family before here that was hiking up to the gravesite. This is one of the um, pine coffins that we use. Uh, it was locally made and we, you can see the ropes that we use to lower um, someone into the gravesite. This is one of our faves. Um, we have, on any given, in any normal spring, we have 12 to 20 um, of the uh, cerulean warblers. We are a breeding site, active, and they come from Brazil every year, and then they'll fly home. They've already left for the year. Um, so this was taken at Taylor Hollow by one of our birders. Um, they really love the hardwood forest on a ridge. Um, and with clear cutting, a lot of that um, habitat is going away. Um, so we're very, Melinda Welton um, was actually out with us and she's done a lot of work protecting the cerulean warblers. Um, and she was the first to spot them and hear them. And then we've had birder after birder be able to catalog these, these particular birds along with many others. But I just love that. They, they're indicative of having that sky blue on their top and then the necklace right here. It's uh, very uncommon to see them down here. Um, 
it's very common to see them way up there or hear them. You don't see them very much because they live above in the tree canopy. And those spice bush and all the wonderful understory trees that we have so many of grow their insects. And the insects will rise into the tree canopy and they feed. And that's the source for raising their young. So a really special little bird. Uh, this is the bottom of one of the graves at Larkspur. Um, David, that works with me, our assistant director, uh, we craft these for every burial. Um, it's a part of what we do. Everyone's a little bit different. Um, we generally try to listen to someone and they tell us what their favorites are. This was designed after the sunset on the ocean. Um, and you may think, well, what in the world? That's, that, that's kind of a waste or... The truth of the matter is what we're doing here is we're creating an opportunity where we've break, broken down some barriers and we allow people to get close and beca become comfortable with what's happening. And I kind of use the idea of a mother bird feathering a nest and preparing to receive something very special. On the flip side of that, this is a great nitrogen-rich layer to help nature do its job. So it's beneficial to receive the body on a bed of... of of um, foliage like this and underneath there'll be other layers sometimes we place um, old logs in the bottom and then we'll cover it over with pine straw that the more air space that you can create the better for receiving um, yeah this is um, wild bergamot I believe we um, we do planting, so every grave site becomes an active moment of restoration in the nature preserve. So where we are now used to be, um, they used to have cattle, they used to grow sorghum, and they grew tobacco, and they grew corn. So the place has really been through a lot. So we're doing everything that we can to actively restore it to more of a native ecosystem that it would have been like before um, it was degraded over time by human activity. Um, this was planted. You saw the coffin earlier in the, um, in the slides. That particular picture um, was the grave site of this lady. So the following spring, the family came back. We organized with Grow Wild, the species that would prefer the particular area. And we provided those to the family, and we all did a native planting of the grave site to restore it. And we generally will do that with each family, and we'll have seasonal plantings either in the fall with our trees in the ecosystem of the woods, or we'll do the spring planting for wildflowers and native grasses to restore the meadow. There's some of our volunteers. Who's that, who's that guy? <laughs> We, ha we host volunteers on a regular basis that are passionate about what we've done and have been to the site. Um, Jack's a perfect example. Um, he's been through this before, so he comes and lends a hand when he has time to give. Um, and sometimes that is when we have someone that is having a burial. And sometimes it's when we're having just a normal hike on a Saturday, which we do one a month. And if it's not in person on the preserve, we'll do an info session online if the weather's terrible. What, the first Saturday of every month? Second Saturday. Second Saturday. It's either virtual or, or in person, and you can learn all, all about it on our website where you have the tour tab. This is a few falls ago, and it was just really beautiful. This is what a family sees before they are, when they arrive to a gravesite. They don't see a lot of... Uh, man-made construction things, um, folding chairs that kind of seem a little out of place, a big green tent that everybody just wants to huddle under because they don't know what else to do. Um, so we try to keep it as open as possible. If we have a rain event, we will provide umbrellas and a canopy. Um, but normally we dodge the weather because most people like to um, spend time outside when it's, when it's not raining. Um, this, speaking of rain, this is actually dew on a cicada wing on a gravestone, and I think it was actually um, uh, your wife's. It was right over there, and I stopped that day, and it just caught my eye and took a picture of it. It's amazing what these iPhones will do these days. Yeah. This is one of the willow baskets. Um, it's made of sustainable willow, um, and it um, biodegrades very easily. 
Um, we try to think of everything that, um, whether we're wearing it or whether it's going around us, that goes into the grave is compostable or biodegradable so that it will break down over time and, and rejoin the ecosystem. I guess you have to be careful with the clothing because so many clothing has plastic polyester. Yeah, we have a we have a com it's a common question that we get every time and generally um, people are dressed very minimally. So we don't we don't bury people in Prada suits or anything fancy like that or shoes generally. Um, just cotton clothing, cotton pajamas. A cotton gown, something very simple is normally what people choose. Also, favorite T-shirts are a po are a very popular one, like a green T-shirt. One hundred percent cotton. <laughs> Not kidding. This is a shrouded burial. Um, this is for Tolu Quinn, who started the Nashville Food Project. Tolu um, had a diagnosis of a glioblastoma and lived with that diagnosis for several years, but did her planning with us and her family. Um, and they um, allowed us, they wanted us to be able to share photos um, and their story to help other people because it was so powerful for when we had the conversation with them for the first time. Uh, so when Tolu died, her husband Robbie and their two little children came and we did a nature hike to pick a site for mom. And we kind of treated it like we were, where, where do you want to stop for, where, where's the site that you want to stop for a picnic? What's a pretty site that you want to stop and sit a while and maybe write in your journal? So rather than, we're picking a grave for mom, we try to really shift and kind of um, uh, approach it in a different way at Larkspur when we're speaking with people. Um, create a new language. What are the bees? Are they bees? Those are wool. We actually uh, normally will put flowers over the shroud. In this case, um, uh, Tolu's cousin actually hand wove this particular shroud on a loom while Tolu was sick. And she had those wool um, felted balls. Mm -hmm. And um, I thought they were really beautiful and they went with the, with the shroud so much I asked her if she would bring them and we used them just to drape. And then, before the before we did the burial, we pulled them off and draped them in the tree. Um, so it's really pretty. And this is a um, video here that will show you. I'll try to turn my volume down some for you. The grave sites actually, we, we will groom out the space where we're going to be actively working, where everyone can move around easily. And then after um, the burial is over, as the months change, the mound slowly returns and all of the grasses and wildflowers come back. So if you were to go to see that space now, it would look entirely different. Um, you would see the space um, in full bloom and full growth. This is another shrouded person. And we made, um, we used construction paper for his grandchildren. And we um, bought some of those really neat hole punches. And then we have different leaves and different shapes. So we punched a whole bunch of construction paper that's safe and non-toxic. And we put it in little tubes and all the grandkids got to throw it in with him. So it was kind of special, um, something different. Another way for them to participate this was just recently another one of the baskets. Um, a, neat a neat story about these flowers, too, is all of these flowers that you see were free. And, somebody, and those are all orchids. We work really closely um, with an organization that's pretty new in Nashville. You should have, that's a good person for you to have come. Yeah. <laughs> 
Um, it's called Forward Flora, and they are an eco breakdown organization that will go to a large event, like at the Frist, a wedding, a cocktail party, wherever it is, and when you have tables full of flowers and large arrangements, maybe you have an arch that's got chicken wire in it, you've got plastic tubes, all of that stuff, they break it all down. They repurpose all of the tubes that can go back to the florist, any of the wires that can go back to the florist. They take all of the usable flowers that are left and they'll give them up to us for free. And then any other materials such as stems, damaged flowers, all go to be composted. So they're diverting landfill waste from these large events. It's called Forward Flora. Yeah. We do native stones for those families that are that love the idea of having a stone. They're all very simple. Um, only the name, only the years, um, flat to the ground. Um, they do not disrupt the, the view shed. They're a great hiding spot for insects. Um, so they do serve some great purposes. We also um, will record on each one of the grave sites GPS coordinates. Similar to what the gas company does when they lay gas lines. Um, but in our case, we're rec- using about 25 different satellites and we record GPS on the center of the grave. And then we will record that information, upload it to our software system, make it available to those people that visit so that when you open your smartphone, you can key in John Christian. It pops up where I'm buried in the preserve on your map and you can walk to it. Or you can view my photo and all of my life story. So it's kind of another element of genealogy and telling a person's story. The final way that we mark graves is with a non-biodegradable aluminum medallion that is on a stake that goes directly down into the center of the grave. And you can see one there. This little guy. I took this picture and then a frog jumped right by. I was so, I was that close. I was that close. You can see how people are dressed, the way we're dressed right now when you come to a ceremony. It's a different experience from what most people are used to. Uh, Because a lot of people haven't uh, experienced a burial like this before, we do a lot of education on the front end when we're talking with the family about what to expect and how to prepare. And then we send them little graphics and they can text it directly to everybody that's coming. Generally, we have around 12 to 24 Sometimes if it's a younger person or a very well-known person, then we may have upwards of 75 people there for a burial ceremony. But normally families will still have some type of memorial or some big ceremony elsewhere. Again, all faiths. We do wood burning on the coffin top sometimes. The wood's just, you just can't leave it. I can't leave it alone with it just being blank, you know. Um, so this is, I, when I was doing Sharon's, um, I thought, well, what am I going to put on there? And I was in a garage at a funeral home where this casket was being stored. Um, and I thought, what am I going to put on there? And I looked down and there was a big oak leaf. So I just picked it up and traced it out and then did the rest. So we can really do just about anything. We do, um, have military honors that will, um, be presented at the, at the nature preserve too. Uh, We haven't had any volleys. I don't think that we'll have many people that request volleys. I think that that might disturb the the species of birds. Uh, Might not. But volleys are pretty rare. Um, Taps is very common in folding and presenting the flag. Every ceremony is completely different. It's exactly what somebody wants it to be. We don't say, you can't do that, you can't do that. You have to do it this way, this square way in this box, in these parameters, we really try to listen and allow people to create whatever they want. Hooded warbler? I think hooded warbler. This was a, um, this is a burial that I did earlier this year, not too long ago. This younger man um, was very eclectic. He was a musician and his family told me that I asked, I said, are there some particular flowers you would want me to use? Um, or colors, I, would, I should say. And she sent me the picture of his album. 
and it was those particular primary colors. So we kind of wanted to do something that was um, musical and different, uh, and it was certainly for him. Two youth groups that came um, this, let's see, not this week, but next we have Innsworth sending an entire 100, 100 students for trail cleanup, um, invasive species pooling. They'll spend the whole day with us. So it's a place for learning as much as it is not only about nature, but about end of life practices, too. Um, it's a very unique space. And this is not a dead puppy. I showed this one day and somebody said, it's a dead puppy. I said, no, it's just asleep. It was wore out. <laughs> it was this big, literally. But that was at a burial ceremony that we had. So people do bring their dogs um, when we have ceremonies. And that was getting ready for burial of ashes, which we also do. Um, not only do we bury um, human bodies, but some people, because of particular reasons out of their own control, finances, religious beliefs will be cremated. Um, and cremation is something that if we don't have to do it, um, it saves a lot of carbon from going up into the air and we can put it back in there to reinforce the soil. Um, but in the cases where it happens, um, we have a way to receive them and place them safely in the ground. Um, and this is me decorating a grave um, leading up to a burial of cremated remains. And that was after. Ashes are actually acidic. Bagpipes. Really cool to walk in a nature preserve in the middle of nowhere with perfect quiet and hear these echo. Um, I was saying ashes are actually acidic. The pH of a, uh, human ashes are about the same as hair straightener. So to pour them directly onto the ground or pour them directly into the earth can be a little bit hard for the earth to handle. So we have a special amendment that's mixed with healthy bacteria that helps break down and neutralize that acidity. How do you get there? People always ask, how do you get to Larkspur? Typically, when someone dies, um, a funeral home is called for simple transportation, sanitary care. Um, they contact us and let us know that um, a death has occurred, and we go and meet them for site selection in the nature preserve. We go on a walk. We feel what is around us um, and allow a family to select in a particular area. Uh, the family can meet with the funeral director to do certain little things like the death certificate, obituary, basic things. They can also offer viewing in their facility if you wanted that, some private time. Um, the ceremony would be planned, and the funeral director again would transport um, the person out to Larkspur for the burial. Generally, burials occur within a week to two weeks, most commonly. Um, refrigeration does the same thing as chemical embalming. So we don't have to use all that formaldehyde. Uh, the other, since you're the Sierra Club and you'll get this, the other thing about formaldehyde embalming fluid is the leftover is flushed into the sewer. Oh. You didn't know that, but that's, <laughs> that's what happens. Um, and then the family will gather at Larkspurg for the ceremony. So that's approved by your POTW discharge, or from your discharge? Oh my God. Oh yeah, it's been happening since they started embalming people on kitchen tables in the house. Mm. But I mean, in a funeral home, I would think they have, have They don't have to contain it. Wow. Anywhere. <coughs> Maybe California. Washington. <laughs> Washington. Good, good on them. Um, <coughs> Yeah, I'm good friends with Katrina. I was going to ask about that. Yeah, I'm <laughs> friends with Katrina. So. Whether you're going to that. Well, what we're doing is similar to composting. It just doesn't happen as rapidly. Um, so, But yeah, um, I wouldn't be surprised if there are some states that have some rules in there. Um, but most just don't. Most just don't. And then... 
So the bones, everything gets easy. Yes. Back to the bones take longer, especially the low largest bones of the hips, um, the pelvis area. I um, have exhumed an infant from the 40s that was buried. It was buried deep enough in the ground. Normally people are buried at six feet. We bury people at three feet. Um, it's actually quite a bit from here to here, but that's in the living layer of the soil. If you bury someone deeper than that and you put concrete and metal around them, it generally um, doesn't create much room for much decomposition. Um, so in that case, with the infant that we moved to be with family members in another cemetery that was buried in the 40s, um, all we found was um, the hip bones and some, some hardware from the casket that said daughter. Mm -hmm. And we gathered all the soil up that was discolored um, from the organic material and we placed it in a new container and took it all. Um, that way we could be sure that we got everything. So, you, a question, can you, or should I wait until the end? No, this is kind of the end. We can, we can go into questions. The, um, you can have a body at home with refrigeration. Oh, yes. With uh, ice. Mm -hmm. I think I heard something on our... Yeah, we could almost keep a body in this room. <laughs> you feel it so yeah. cold. Yeah. They will tell you, generally... In a lot of states with home funerals, California is one that specifically has more because cremation rate is really high there and there's not as many cemetery access. Um, a lot of people will have a home vigil before cremation. And to keep a body cool, you turn down the temperature. Or you go to the um, grocery store and you buy dry ice. You put it in a brown paper bag and you place it underneath the body or on the groin and maybe a piece on the chest. And you will just keep that um, keep that going as long as you as long as you need to. Um, normally, our bodies just don't break down that fast. Sometimes they do when we've been pumped full of oxygen and we're retaining water and we become a little bit not as stable as what we would be if I were to pass away right now. You could put me on the table and keep me here for a week, to two weeks, and not have really any big problem. <laughs> I mean, they sell chicken. They have 14 days to sell chicken after it's slaughtered in the grocery. <laughs> Vegetarians. <laughs> mm -hmm. So, is there no way to avoid the funeral home? The there place? absolutely is. How do you do that? You don't call them. <laughs> <laughs> um, funeral directors are funeral directors. Um, and there's a spot on the death certificate in the state of Tennessee. It says funeral director or person acting as such. A family has a right to remove their loved one from any hospital facility in the state of Tennessee and take them home. Wow. A family has the right to keep their loved one at home should they die at home under normal circumstances and supervised by a doctor. In other words, I didn't just die in the middle of the night and... I'm 44, and they're like, what in the world happened to him? They're going to need to do an autopsy, generally. But if I'm an older person with normal health stuff, and, you know, I'm, let's say I'm 94 and I die at home, they're not doing an autopsy, generally. Um, so I could stay at home very easily. And I've had lots of families do that, and I talk them through the whole process. We actually have a page on our website dedicated to that. I became a home funeral guide. And I studied under Jerry Grace Lyons, who started a program in um, California. So that's the reason I spoke a little bit about California and keeping people at home and the cremation right there, because there are so many people that do that now. And um, I studied and became a home funeral guide after I'd become a funeral director and after I'd left. But I wanted to really try to understand a lot of different uh, modalities so that I could be better prepared to help people that want to do something a little more naturally. And sometimes that's not calling a funeral director, and that's okay. If you have a, a good supportive family and a lot of hands to help, it's very easy to do. It's second nature. It really is. Um, if you don't, if it's just you and a spouse and you're not in good health or you don't have a lot of support from your community, um, it might be best to have a little support from the funeral home. And that may simply be 
transportation, bathing and sanitary care. That means cleaning someone and keeping them cool before burial. That's it. Does anybody ever do any research on editors in terms of, you know, it's really cool what happens with the body and the microbes and the so and so mm -hmm. scientists. Mm -hmm. So I didn't know if, you know, you had allowed the boys to do CSI. Yeah, well, maybe the body farm at UT, I put some stuff up there. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so I think it works. We get so much from biologists. We're one of a, we're one of about 12 um, conservation burial ground, which is a, a natural burial ground that has a conservation easement as well. That's working to actively restore an ecosystem, not just keep it mowed and put someone in there without chemicals. We're actually going above and beyond to restore the ecosystem at the same time and protect it. So there are about a dozen, and they're growing. We're getting closer to 15. I know there's a few in different states that are coming online. Um, and there are all of us working together. We do work with a lot of universities. Uh, there is research being done out there. Um, I feel like in the future it will become more and more prevalent and we'll have more and more data. Yeah, no, it's very interesting what happens. Yeah. 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 Can you give us an idea of the cost? Yes. At Larkspur, what we charge for a burial space. The opening and closing, native plant revegetation, the GPS marking, everything we do before, during, and the perpetual care of the site forever is four thousand dollars, and and um, that's generally on par. I know that right now there are several places in Nashville that charge more than four thousand dollars for cremation. There are several that charge less, um, but cremation is slowly becoming more and more expensive as people move away from traditional funerals. Uh, so they have to make up the slack somewhere. Um, and generally at a funeral home that provides simple transportation and refrigeration, um, that's going to be around $2,000 to $3,000 maybe. Um, every family that always um, calls and talks to us and says, Mom died, we learned all about you, this is what she wanted. If it's happened kind of suddenly, they say, who should we call? Who has done this and what's the procedure? We'll generally give families two or three different people, um, funeral directors that have been to Larkspur and helped a family through this process, and we'll say, give them a call, ask them their prices, and see how they talk to you, and then pick one. Mm -hmm. And generally, that's the most helpful way. Um, so we can. The funeral directors that come bring them to you? Mm hmm. Yep. So uh, to give you an idea on the par of the bigger spectrum of all the other options, um, we're less than in most cases. Right. Yeah. And um, another thing, the sh you saw Toulouse really colorful shroud. We do also wrap people directly in an heirloom quilt, as long as it's cotton. Um, so we can forego a casket. We can forego all of those elements in most cases. Um, we actually did that at our last burial. The family provided a, a, a special blanket that was of 100% cotton. And we wrapped her up, and there were flowers, and it was just beautiful. Uh, I just recently buried my mother, and she had lots of other things inside her. Okay. What do you do about those? Generally, because those other things have already been manufactured and created, and they've served a purpose... And it will be quite invasive to remove them. We leave them in. Unless it's a pacemaker with a battery that's yeah. superficial, we will remove those. So you do remove pacemakers? We always ask that those are removed. And those do are... The, do the, the funeral director that sends it? The funeral director does, or I can easily do it. Yeah. Uh, so bear, you, and I can talk to you on the phone and tell you how to do it, too. Very, very simple to do. You can feel them right here in most cases. Yeah. Yeah. So we, we tend to lean towards, are we creating new, uh, are we creating new excess, or is this served a purpose? You know, with our hips, they a lot of titanium here eventually. <laughs> probably, but I think, but for the most part, it's quite inert. And you know, that may be, and I think that may be something that um, we evolve away from, and we start, and we have directors that start removing that. Because there are a lot of companies now, when people are cremated, all of those are taken away. So 
they were once the once the fire goes through and takes the bone to nothing, um, the metal pieces are left, and those are recycled, and those companies buy them back. And they will repurp- They will melt it down and repurpose it. Yeah. So yeah, there. And I had a funeral director the other day that had someone's ashes out. Um, I was there to help shroud a body because they're not so much versed in that as placing someone in a container. Mm-hmm. So um, I was helping do that, and he told me he said, "Look," and he had a big cardboard box full of hip joints and knees and wires and pins. And he said, "Oh yeah, you see this machine that we used? To, they have a machine." that has a hopper in it that processes and grinds up the bones. Um, it's not ash, actually. It's a bone fragment. And uh, it was a nice, red, brand-new machine. And I said, oh, my goodness, did you get a new a new machine? He said, actually, we did. The company that, that we give all of our things to actually gave it to us for free. So there's a lot of uh, momentum about recycling those pieces. So um, we may move it, move in that direction in the future. Yep. What about somebody who's out of state? Common question. Another rule in the United States that is more of a myth that was created by the funeral industry, similar to using vaults and being embalmed, is that you can't cross the state line with a dead body unless it's embalmed. That's a myth. It's not correct. So they can be transported anywhere around the country. I've even brought someone unembalmed from Vienna, Austria, that lived here, that went there for a special treatment to help others um, because he had a very rare cancer, and he died on the trip. And we brought him back. It was a month after he died that we buried him. Did you have to, you had to keep him cool then? Uh-huh. They placed him in a special casket that... Um, that sealed and it was and they had cooling agents in there to keep the body cool. Hmm. Yeah. So there's a separate cost if you have a cremated body for burial. Mm-hmm. It's not the four thousand it's it's two thousand. Mm-hmm. And do you still have the special tree option? Uh, we do plant trees. Um, we'll do a tree planting on graves that are in the woodland. Um, and we work with our native growers and, and native species as well um, to determine the species that will actually viably survive in a particular location in our preserve. So we don't, just because it's a Tennessee native doesn't mean that we plant it. It needs to be a, spe- a species that's native and will actually grow and thrive on this particular site. So we don't want to bring something in and it can repopulate a whole area with something that shouldn't actually be there. So we work with ecologists on that and growers so that we have something special to plant with people. So is this uh, land that was a farm mm-hmm. from the family is now owned and overseen by the Nature Conservancy? No. No. So Larkspur. So the Nature Conservancy is involved. We gave an easement to the Nature Conservancy. For the other for the other conserv- uh, for the other area that they have. No, for our whole property where people are being buried. They own the adjacent state natural area. The Nature Conservancy does. Right. But mm-hmm. the Nature Cons- but but what I'm asking is the Nature Conservancy has, you know, it's I think it's the largest real estate uh, owner in the world. They have 119 million acres yeah, right, globally exactly. under protection. Right. And so yours is not though. Under- they do not own our property. So that means that what will ha- what can happen in perpetuity to yours? Nothing, because we gave all of the rights away to the Nature Conservancy. Okay, so like, so oh, their oh, easement oh, or oh, deed oh. restriction controls how that land can be used. Mm-hmm. But it's stipulated because we wrote a binding contract together, and it says what we can do, mm-hmm. and which is what we're doing now. So there, I noticed that there is a um, barn on it. Is mm-hmm. there going to be any uh, any more agriculture work, so to speak? Whatever the agriculture would be, it doesn't have to be tobacco, et cetera, but... The only agriculture that we could have on the site would be bees. 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 We cannot grow and harvest food from the site. That's in our that's in our conservation easement. We wrote it in specifically. So there will not be any other agricultural use. Yeah, and no one will be doing any other kinds of like you know gleaning or anything from there. No. 
and we uh, meet with the Nature Conservancy on site annually and we update our baseline study so that we can track the progress of the ecosystem. And it is, uh, it's at least second, if not third, cut. I mean, it's, I don't know how long ago the, the original was cut. Oh, but probably in the 50s, 60s was when it was cut. The 1500s. No, no, 50s, 1950s. Oh, well, so that would have been the second, or third growth anyway. Yeah. So what we're, you're doing now is restoring whatever would be appropriate, given that it's not going to be whatever that was there, because it was also probably burned from time to time, et cetera, so it's not actually. Correct. Going back to something around We're trying to get it back to as, as normal as we could. Exactly. Okay. I'm just, just trying to figure out what oh, the no, these are great. is, given that These are great know, questions. Yeah. yeah. And also what will be around there. And, you know, the, maybe, yeah. Okay. Yeah. And there will be, I mean, eventually, my assumption is there will be, you know, people taking pieces, you know, trees down because that would be the appropriate way of actually dealing with it. That's okay, right. Good. <laughs> yes. Forestry plan. Yes. yes, we have to thin out some of the tulip poplars so that we can restore oh, those oh, oats. <laughs> <laughs> those are great questions though. We also can use fire in our meadows to control that ecosystem. Um, yeah. What's the total capacity of bodies there? That's a good question. Um, generally, in our particular site, density, let's imagine that this room is a cemetery. Okay, let's call this Radnor Cemetery. And it's a conventional cemetery that doesn't care about, the, about nature. Okay, so this is just a normal cemetery run of the mill, like you'd see out on Thompson Lane or anywhere. Everybody's side by side. Okay, imagine now taking away the majority of these chairs and there being three people in the back row, three people in the middle row, and three people in the front row. So our density is much lower at Larkspur than what it is at a place like Woodlawn or a big conventional cemetery. Actually, at Larkspur, per acre, about 100 to 300 people, whether it's meadow or whether that's the woodland. In the woodland, it's going to be less because we're working with nature, um, not against it. So we're going to leave and dodge those trees and native species that are thriving. Um, but at, at a larger cemetery, similar to what we've described in this room full of chairs, the graves are generally about 1,000 to 1,500 per acre. So what you're doing is, if you can imagine this piece, this little piece of paper, if I took a hole punch and punched it side by side through the whole thing, it would be so easy for, for it to break apart because we just destroyed it. But if you are careful with your density, it still survives intact. And then you can use each one of those points as a restoration project and help restore that native ecosystem. How long does it take for somebody to, the expectation that it's, the person's completely, completely gone? Well, or you know, worms and, Right. Generally, with generally within a year to two years, um, soft tissue and everything is primarily gone. So that could mean that within ten years, you could there is a person there. Could, but in our model, we do not want to reuse the space. Why? Because we, when someone purchases like Jack, his grave site. We take a portion of that, those funds and put it into our conservation fund and we use it to purchase and save more land. When we purchased Taylor Hall, the Taylor Hollow property, we were at 112 acres. And I haven't announced this to anybody, but I'll tell you. We recently purchased 43 additional acres with the funds that were set aside from families. So we're at that original 155 of the original farm. How much is around there that you can expand into? She a says, lot. I'm good. A lot. And the families that were concerned initially now see it as a massive blessing. Mm -hmm. And they're probably considering selling their farms in the future if they ever have to. Are you, are you buying it at agriculture prices or at development prices? Or depends, depends on, on who the farmer is. Depends on the property. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we purchased the 155 acres at a really discounted okay. price from the family. But you're also taking all 
Okay. So we're in, yeah, it's coming out of agriculture and it's going into, it can't really be used for anything, conservation status. And um, that takes a lot of value away from the property. Um, value. No, 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 wrong, wrong, yeah, right. Uh, right. <laughs> you know what I mean. Yeah. It takes dollar signs away from it, but it's more valuable for land and for the ecosystem and our communities. So now Mr. Adcock that lived in the hollow. What watershed is it in? Do you know? Hmm? What watershed is it in? It's the, um, we have, uh, one of our um, spring heads is the beginning of the Old Hickory watershed and comes into the Cumberland River. We've actually adopted the main stream on the road that separates our preserve from the state natural area um, through the Cumberland River Compact. So we work close with them too. Um, yes, sure. Uh, there was a documentary about um, our process over the past, it was filmed over the past seven years of my life. And um, it's available on pbs.org if you have Passport. It was available for free and showed on NPT and it's showed around the country. Um, if you have Apple iTunes um, or Apple TV, you can rent it there. Um, you can also do that on um, Amazon because PBS has taken it down from free on their website and now you have to be a member or watch it on Passport to be able to access it. And, and it's called? Barry it's called Barry Me and Taylor Hollow. Mm -hmm. It's really a good show. How many people work in the We have four staff members currently. Um, and that just went, that just doubled in size within the past <coughs> month. <laughs> so it was just me and the support of our board of directors um, over the past, till 2019, let's just say that, from 2013 to 2019, it was me as the primary, um, as the primary employee. And then we opened in 2018, we brought in David Polnaroff, which Jack knows well, who is our assistant director. He was at Prairie Creek Conservation Cemetery in Gainesville, Florida for many years. Um, where he helped run that organization, so he joined uh, my team. And we've since hired a field assistant that works on site on the property on a regular basis. And we've been working closely with the Vanderbilt University Divinity School. And we have a um, chaplain now um, that is about to graduate. Um, but they have been um, using our <coughs> They have been using Larkspur as a place for field education for chaplains that do not seek out a hospital job, that want to interact in a different way. So if you can imagine an enlightened chaplain that's really work working with landscape, um, we are growing that program too. So, yeah. So are you looking for the next thing? Or are you the next property? Well. No, you said that when you were at the funeral home, you were like... Oh, no, no. I think, I don't think, I have, I have all the next things already written down in the books at home, and they're big, and they're wonderful. We have 172 acres in Hickman County that we'll be opening as our second property, and we have 433 acres in Cannon County that we'll be opening as our third property. Wow. That's a lot of land for us to steward. Uh, we're working with Tin Green Land Conservancy on the uh, Cannon County property, and we'll probably work with them on the um, Bonacqua or Hickman County property. Um, but because of the Duck River watershed, it's really unique. It's got a creek that flows through it. It's really special. You've already acquired those properties? Those both were given to us. Wow. The first was a gift from Father Charlie Strobel oh. and his family. And um, we have already been, I've already gone to the county and both counties and everything's approved and we are actually readying and stabilizing, cleaning up the properties from all the ways that they've been kind of left over time. You know, so you think we, you think I'm gonna build a beautiful house here. It's gonna become garbage one day. So and in that case, we have three houses on the property in Hickman County that all had to be removed and everything dug out of the ground and all the trash piles that were in the, you know how people throw it when we didn't have municipal or county support for trash or a dump. You'd find a ditch back on the 
other side of the property and throw everything away. it's really neat to look through that garbage.